This episode is brought to you by Painless Pregnancy. In case you missed it, I worked with Painless Pregnancy very soon after the birth of my third baby. And honestly, I wish I had found them earlier in my childbearing journey. I am so excited to tell you all about Painless Pregnancy and how no matter where you are in your motherhood journey, the Painless Pregnancy team can guide you through happy and healthy pregnancies, postpartum healing, and beyond. Stay tuned for our promo code so you can get 10% off of your first visit with Painless Pregnancy. Welcome to The No Podcast with me, Nikki Spo. What is up, fam? You are listening to The No, where it is not about knowing everything, but about coming to know ourselves. I'm your hostess, Nikki Spolstra, and I am happy you're on this journey with me of coming to a place of deep inner knowing, following our birthrights, and doing it with confidence and grace. If you aren't already subscribed to The No, go ahead and click that subscribe button so that you never miss an update. Today, I am welcoming back a woman who I feel comfortable enough now to call a regular Dr. Rashna Buksani Murpuri for a conversation about narcissism and how to navigate it. This is part of a multi-part series we are doing, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to chat with an expert like her. Dr. Rashna Buksani Murpuri is a licensed mental health counselor based in Florida. With nearly 20 years of experience nationally and internationally, she has worked in government, private practice, and school settings. And Dr. Buksani Murpuri is a board-certified telemental health provider through Buksani Counseling Care. Her approach focuses on providing a safe and empathetic environment for clients to heal and become resilient and empowering them to reclaim their strength. With multicultural counseling experience, she understands and addresses cultural dynamics in mental health issues. Dr. Buksani Murpuri's expertise includes adjustment disorders, anxiety disorders, conflict resolution therapy, depression, life transitions, marriage and family counseling, maternal mental health, parenting counseling, personality disorders, and eating disorders. She recently got trained and is certified in working with victims of narcissistic abuse and is a certified narcissistic abuse treatment clinician. Dr. Buksani is also certified in dialectical behavior therapy and employs mindfulness, relaxation, and distress tolerance techniques to aid clients in navigating navigating life's challenges. She's an active member of the American Counseling Association, American Psychological Association, and the American Mental Health Counseling Association, committed to providing affordable, quality mental health support to all. Now, as we go into this conversation, I want everybody to keep in mind that we are not giving out professional advice at this time. We are covering a broad topic, and these are our opinions, the opinions of myself and Dr. Buksani Murpuri. So I'm really, really looking forward because... Dr. Buksani is an expert in this field, and we have spoken about this a little bit in some of our previous episodes. I think today is going to be a huge learning experience for a lot of people. I want to encourage everybody not to go around like diagnosing their friends and family over here. We are here to get information to talk about a topic that is really just like becoming widespread and get some like more clear definition about what narcissism is and how to move through it. So with that, let's get started with Dr. Rashna Buksani Murpuri. Dr. Rajna. Hi, Nikki. I'm so excited. <laughs> you know what? It, I think this topic has been long overdue just because of, I think, the recent social media uh, coverage it has gained. And and really, I, I must say, uh, not very accurate um, social media coverage that is gained. So um, I am glad we're here uh, to talk about this, maybe debunk some myths, but also educate um, you know, your listeners about what is narcissism and, and really it's so nuanced that you you really just cannot be throwing out that word without understanding what it is. Yeah, definitely. I think that like, you know, something really amazing happened with COVID. I mean, obviously COVID was so difficult for so many people and so many people were struggling and suffering. But what it did do, one of the many things, I think that there were obviously benefits to COVID and the things that like how people and humanity had to pivot through such an unprecedented time. But something that I think everybody saw was just like the outpour of information. You know, everybody had to kind of switch their modalities of whether it was teaching or getting psychological care or I mean, all of it, literally all of it. And so you hear a lot of people on Instagram, on TikTok, on social media, on YouTube, wherever, like giving out this advice, which thank goodness, right? Because now therapy talk, what people call therapy talk, is accessible to more people. And, you know, it's great, 
that people are talking about it, right? We want people to have a sense of awareness. Things that like people were not going to therapy at all whatsoever might have had some type of stigma. I personally know for myself that I don't think I would have gotten treatment for my alcohol addiction had it not been during the shutdown. Because I don't think I would have gone, walked myself into a center personally and been like, here, I'm here. I have an alcohol problem. You know, part of the fact that I could do it via Zoom and be like, shut my screen off, you know, and be completely anonymous really, really helped me. Absolutely. With that, there's an influx of information from so many different people and we don't know what these sources are. And then there's also, you know, like the human nature part of it to overgeneralize something. Right. And say, oh, this person's a narcissist. This person is this. That person is bipolar. And this per- and, and we can just point the fingers based on all the information that we have. And now everybody walks around and we think that we're therapists. <laughs> and here's the thing, Nikki. The, so a couple of things there. One is we therapists still don't understand narcissism. Thank you for saying that. Like, t- t- like explain that a little bit more. The DSM. Which is what? Okay. So the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. That is what we use. It's our Bible, right? So we go by the DSM, which which kind of uh, points out all the disorders. The DSM only, you know, narcissism only showed up in the DSM in 1980. It's oh, wow. So, you know, until then, we really didn't even recognize it as an issue, uh, as an, a mental health issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. Now, there on... There have been so many theorists that have come up with very, um, you know, very important findings. But again, I really have to say we don't have a complete understanding still of narcissism or any of those personality disorders, really, because we're still trying to grapple. We're still trying to learn about them as we go along. So absolutely, I agree with you. And it's damaging to be going around labeling people because what it does is it increases the stigma around it. So then people who are maybe victims of, you know, narcissistic abuse, they're gaslighting themselves because they're not sure. You know, it's like, okay, but am I really going through this? Do I really need to get help? You know, or is it me? It can backfire, even though, yes, there is, um, you know, a positive to it. And I, I'm glad people are talking about it. I think, uh, you know, especially topics like that, that are so confusing and so nuanced, you know, we just have to proceed with caution. I appreciate you saying that. And I think it's important for everybody to keep in mind. And it's just like in any field, I think, like for me personally, in in a much different way in education, I was certified to teach English language arts, right? So I know language, right? That's it. But guess what? Language language is changing. And, and, And so is Everything, medicine is changing. So even the experts like yourself, you know, I think the sign of like a really great psychologist or any type of professional is somebody who's willing to keep learning about it and having the humility to say, you know what, I understand that this is ever changing. I understand that there's more and more information out there. I understand that there's going to be studies that reveal themselves over time and that we are taking an ongoing look at this rather than looking at something in a vacuum. And I think that people everywhere need to know that. Right. And I'm going to say, I don't think they're experts in this field. I'm going to very... I'm going to call you an expert. Very (laughs) humbly say that, because again, because there's so much we don't understand about it, I don't know how they can be an expert. Right. The field that there is so much still to be understood. I hear that. However, we're better than what we were. So that's great. Amen to that. So let's, let's start off with like defining narcissism and kind of breaking down like the different types of narcissism because there there is a spectrum and like you said on the the chart therapists are moving away and psychologists moving away from this like the chart and moving towards like a more spectrumed approach yes the icd-11 is actually no longer going to be talking about the specific disorders but we're, we're, we're actually going to diagnose personality disorders really mild moderate severe Okay, Because what we've realized is there's a lot of overlap uh, in these disorders. And plus, I think it's great because, again, if we can do that, it takes away the stigma and more people might be open to actually seeking help. So, yes, we are, we're moving away from that, which I am really excited about. According to DSM-5, we have a criteria for narcissism. And think about narcissism and what we think about is that grandiose presentation, a person who has... Um, 
you know, an inaccurate self appraisal, you know, almost thinks that they are that important. Uh, you know, the sense of entitlement or that I'm special, I'm unique, um, you know, I'm better than everybody else. And then also the antagonistic piece, which is, you know, uh, where manipulation comes in, where gaslighting comes in that, okay, I am willing to use somebody for my game. And it doesn't really matter because I don't feel a certain way about it. As long as this person is serving my purpose, it's fine. And lack of empathy. Remember all of this so the arrogance and the, um, um, the, you know, the envy of others and the, the grandiosity, but it's, it's really covering up a deep level of insecurity. Interesting. So that is the DSM definition of what narcissism is, right? Okay. But like, just to say, I'm like listening to you. I'm like, I think I'm important. I think I'm special and unique. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, immediately I'm hearing this and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, my narcissist, right? Like, but yeah, like I think that I deserve nice things and I do think I deserve a, I deserve a beautiful, rich life by all of those definitions. And I think that I'm special and I think, and I want other people to believe that about themselves, right? So where do we get into the differ- the difference between like having like self-value and knowing your self-worth where I do believe that I'm special. I do believe I deserve a beautiful life and then crossing over into like narcissistic tendencies. That brings me to the AMPD. So the alternate model model of personality disorder. So the alternate model breaks it down is really the, you know, uh, self interpersonal functioning. And then we'll get to the criterion B. Let, let's hold off on that. So let's talk about the self and interpersonal functioning. For you and I, okay, when we talk about self, so yes, as an identity, we experience ourselves as unique. We have clear boundaries between self and others. Um, we have a stable self esteem and an and accurate self appraisal. Also, of course, in a capacity of, of having different ranges of emotions. All of that is okay, that's healthy. When we talk about self direction, we set goals for ourselves and we want those goals to be constructive. We want them to be, um, you know, and also be a guide for how I internally behave, right? Because my behavior has to be directed towards those goals I'm trying to achieve. Right. We think about interpersonal relationships. We have empathy as in we have an understanding and an appreciation of other people's experiences, their emotions, their motivations, um, and we tolerate the, the differences, right? So, uh, you know, I understand that not everybody's going to be like me. And then when we look at intimacy, we are able to form those meaningful connections with other people because we have the empathy, because we have an understanding and because we have an understanding of self, yep. the boundary between myself and others and a stable self-esteem, I'm able to actually have those intimate relationships and I, I can get close to people and have a mutual regard. Let's talk about how that's different. So how these criteria show up differently in a person with narcissism. We have a sense of self that's really about us, right? So I have a self-esteem that's, you know, that's not dependent on somebody else. Oh, wow. For a narcissist, it's completely and solely based on what other people think of them. The goals that they set are not because they, you know, those constructive goals and they're working towards achieving because, hey, I want to have a meaningful life. I want to have a purpose. I want to do something good. No, the goals are set merely to get validation and admiration from other people. For a narcissist, the relationship really depends on how this person can serve my needs. If that person ceases to serve my needs, that's it. You don't exist for me. That's the difference between a healthy person who has a self-esteem and we feel good about ourselves and we feel good about the goals that we are setting versus a narcissist. From my understanding, it's the difference between saying it's the self and versus the self only. Like when I think about somebody who has healthy self-esteem, I'm like, okay, me, yes, I am important. I am valuable. I whatever, whatever. And other people and my partner and my children and my family and whatever versus me full stop absolutely i mean think about this these are very distressed individuals right because if i'm walking around and my whole sense of identity is based on how other people 
uh, you know, what they think of me and how they see me. Oh my gosh, that's exhausting. I just felt exhausted thinking about that. And I actually like, I was talking to someone and I'm like, oh my gosh, it must be so exhausting to like care so much all the time about what people are going to think about your life choices. Like, do you believe in what you're doing? Like, then do it. Absolutely. And there's no sense of identity. There's no uh, intimacy. So interpersonal function is completely uh, distorted. But then you have the criterion B, which doesn't exist in normal people, right? Like, you know, uh, people like you and I who, you know, have a good self-esteem, we're not going to think of these things. So there's then antagonism and attention seeking, okay? Or the grandiosity and the attention seeking. I may think that, hey, you know what? I deserve good things because I work so hard versus a narcissist who believes I deserve good things just because I am. I am better than others, right? So that sort of grandiosity. And then, of course, the attention seeking, which is tricky because in pursuit of that attention seeking, everything is about what the other person thinks about me. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that attention. It could be good, bad or ugly. You know, again, people who have healthy um, self-esteem, we, we don't go around doing that. We have a general understanding about narcissism. So what are, there's a spectrum of, of narcissism, no? Yeah. Well, the types of narcissism and that's where it gets even trickier. So what are, so then what are the different types of narcissism? The ones that we know are the grandiose. Okay. And when you think of narcissism, that's what you think about, right? Right. Person who's so... Uh, of important full of them, themselves and you know the grandiose presentation where again you know exactly what I've said they look for validation and admiration from other people and all of that okay so everything that I've told you and everything that the DSM talks about is about the grandiose narcissist so you know those are um, we have an understanding of that now let's talk about the next type which is the vulnerable narcissist so think about a continuum okay so borderline is on one side the grandiose narcissist is on the other and in the middle somewhere is a vulnerable narcissist. Okay, so the vulnerable narcissist is almost a person who's picking from both, who's picking a little bit from the borderline and a little bit from the grandiose narcissist. Okay, so when we think about the vulnerable narcissist, what, what are some of the things that we see? This person uh, actually comes across as or, or presents as deeply self-critical, which we will never see in a, in a grandiose. So a grandiose person is not going to come and talk down upon themselves, but we will see that. And these are the ones, if we ever get a narcissism therapy, these are the ones that are coming because we're not seeing the grandiose people coming into therapy. Right. And why is that? Well, they don't think they are the problem, right? <laughs> you know, and it, it's sad because I'll tell you what, I feel if I had to define, uh, you know, personality disorders, I really believe that they are disorders of relationships because what, what ends up happening is that, yes, it affects the individual, but it affects the people around them much more. So right. we see in therapy a lot of people who are actually dealing with narcissistic spouses or narcissistic parents or, you know, workplace narcissism. It's affecting all the people around them, but it doesn't doesn't seem to be affecting the grandiose narcissist. And that's what's what's sad because it's people who are getting into these relationships or uh, who've been a part of, you know, those, those sibling or the parent relationships and they have no understanding of what's going on with them. Negative mood states, again, something that we don't see in the grandiose person. We see this person as being shy. I know, you know, it like we define it as shy, but really, you know, it's more social anxiety. So wait a second. I'm a little bit confused about it. So the first thing you said was like... A vulnerable narcissist is somebody who can like almost what like talks down upon themselves like oh my gosh like self-shaming but like yes. for what reason why well because they believe they're the victim uh, okay self-shaming and victimhood yes so so these are the people who are failure to launch oh I feel like we all know one person like that in our life this is a person who you know I did everything everything I did everything Right. Or like, you know, I am so good at what I do, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm good at what I do. I give it, you know, everything, but see people around me or, or life or situation or society or it's somebody else. And thus, they really don't, um, 
and and it's again they that's what they're stating but it's really people who just don't try and then complain we see them in therapy because of that because we you know these are the ones who are presenting with depression anxiety maybe anger right so they they, they have um some psychopathology that brings them into therapy we call it a disowed feelings of specialness because they so badly want to feel special but then everything that they do does not really help them uh, or and, and they end up not feeling special but so desperately inside they want they want to feel those feelings that the grandiose person feels but they just don't and then that affects them where they get depressed anxious come into therapy and oh my gosh the world is such a bad place we need to fix people around me and you know i don't know what to do so we have the vulnerable narcissist lives in a perpetual sense of victimhood and typically has social anxiety mass which is like kind of like masqueraded as shyness is that what you're saying yes it may come across as oh this person is shy but they're not they're, they're really experiencing anxiety and like i said the constant feeling of i'm the victim here the world is against me i would have been able to do this if it was not for this person or or this situation but the the fact of the matter is they don't actually try and what are some of the other qualities of a vulnerable narcissist they're going to talk about covert and overt right so the overt is what you see and then i will tell you also some of the thoughts and feelings and then we can compare to that to the grandiose okay so when we think about behavior so this is a person who's constantly moping uh complaining they isolate themselves because obviously they're socially anxious uh they constantly seek reassurance they constantly seek for someone to rescue them these people also get very angry so that's where the also the borderline piece because because as emotions they mimic the borderline right but where a person with the borderline personality may engage in self harm you won't see that in any of the narcissists so that's kind of where they're different but where they're similar is that emotional intensity which you don't see in the grandiose person because the grandiose is so good at poking and then gaslighting saying are you okay what's wrong with you why are you reacting these people will actually react let's talk about the covert stuff right so why is everyone out there to get me i'm just not good as everybody else uh you, you know that that sense of rumination of a- anything that happens you know so oh my gosh you know somebody looked at me in a certain way and or somebody said something and that is so insulting and i'm going to keep thinking about it and always passive aggressive and especially when they feel shame and nikki this this thing about the shame rage cycle uh we need to understand because that's key for any narcissist out there but there's a shame rage cycle so just keep in mind that the vulnerable narcissist is a person who is going to be more passive aggressive when they feel shame like i'm not going to talk to you you know versus uh, a grandiose narcissist when they feel shame oh my gosh that's when we see the wrath of the narcissist and that shame can be felt by nothing that anybody else is doing it could just be oh I didn't fare well or, or something happened at work today that I just didn't feel good about okay wait now I'm the here comes the ra- uh, the wrath and the rage for the grandiose okay so with today we've spoken about then so far we have the vulnerable narcissist the grandiose narcissists and the covert and the overt the covert and overt are not types they are just basically going a little more deeper into the vulnerable and grandiose as in you know the overt is what we are able, like what they're presenting with and the covert is what their thoughts and feelings are all right my loves i want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's episode painless pregnancy i have been working consistently with painless pregnancy since the birth of my third baby and i truly cannot sing their praises enough which is why i'm so excited that they have come on as a partner for the know with nikki spo Painless Pregnancy is the leading in-home concierge physical therapy company focusing on the pregnant and postpartum woman. Not only do they provide incredibly valuable services to those women in pain or dysfunction, but they also offer every aspect of wellness. This means that they take care of you during your pregnant and postpartum season of life. They keep you strong and flexible. 
They keep your pants dry and your sex pain free. They even do all of the body work needed to maximize your delivery. If you are currently pregnant or have ever been pregnant, you need to reach out to them. They are skilled in assisting with like a bajillion women specific needs, such as pregnancy and postpartum, obviously, vaginal and C-section deliveries, pelvic floor therapy, physical therapy, diastasis recti, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and overall having a healthy pregnancy. I know, I know, some of this stuff is cringe, but these are like real things that happen, and oftentimes women don't want to talk about them. And you know me, I'm going to talk about it. So if you or anyone you know is on a motherhood journey, I highly recommend reaching out to Painless Pregnancy, no matter what season of motherhood that you're in. Use my code NikkiSpo10 for 10% off of your initial visit. For more information, be sure to check out the sponsors page at NikkiSpo.com or check out Painless Pregnancy directly at www.painless-pregnancy.com. Until every woman heals, having this team in your corner to take care of your body is everything. Probably the most dangerous of the narcissists is what we call the malignant narcissist. This person almost borders on psychopathy. This is a person who's really antagonistic, paranoid, sadistic uh, villain because they have absolutely no qualms about exploiting other people, about using other people and, you know, throwing them away. They have no sense of responsibility. They base for them. People are objects, objects to be used and thrown. Um, this is where we see also a lot of coercive control. Sometimes when we talk about coercive control, people, people associate that with physical abuse. It doesn't have to be. So coercive control is any form of psychological uh, control that the narcissist has on the victim, like chronic criticism, monitoring everything. A person I spoke to again a couple of days back who has a narcissistic uh, partner, that guy has cameras. And she was like, he has cameras in my closet. So that's course of control because, you know, you're constantly monitoring. They limit the freedom of the victim, gaslighting, right? So almost invalidating the reality of another individual, threatening, keeping this person away from their support system. It could also include sexual coercion. So all of that we see in a malignant narcissist. I want to talk a little bit about empathy. So we know that the narcissist is generally like devoid of empathy. So, but there are different types of empathy. So let's cover some of those things then. There is cognitive empathy. Okay. Uh, which is, um, I know I should feel bad. Okay, this is a situation. I know I should feel bad in this situation. Then there is emotional empathy, which is me actually feeling bad for another person. You know, so if, if someone is crying, it's like, oh my, you know, I feel I feel bad, right? Yeah. And then there is a compassionate empathy. Most therapists will actually have that compassionate empathy because it's like, oh my gosh, what can I do to help you, right? So, you know, I feel for you, but I also want to do something to help you feel better. The emotional empathy and the, the compassion empathy, of course, is missing in a narcissist, but the narcissist actually has cognitive empathy. So they do know that they need to feel bad about something, right? So they know that this situation should warrant me feeling feeling sad about it. You should feel bad about it, but perhaps it's just not there. They have that understanding, but then they have two more kinds of empathy. One is performance empathy. They are very good, Nikki, at, oh, I can put on an act, you know, so because they have the cognitive piece, remember. So I know that in this situation... I should feel bad. I can put on an act and act it out. And I have seen, because I've, you know, uh, had personal experience with some narcissists, and I have seen they can switch from, you know, somebody being in the hospital and, and you know, tears, oh my gosh, I feel so bad, to a minute later that, oh yeah, you know what, so I'm actually going out tonight. To, like, I mean, that's performance empathy. And the other one that they have is something that we call a transactional empathy. I can show you empathy because I need something from you, <laughs> right? And again, all this relates back to the fact that they have the cognitive piece. 
So that's the empathy piece that we need to understand with ourselves because it's, again, it's not as easy as saying, oh, they don't have empathy. And that's kind of where we, it gets very tricky, uh, Nikki, because you know what? When we give personality assessments to people, right, as therapists, narcissists believe they have, they're oozing with empathy, right? Because cognitively, they know they need to feel bad about something. So they don't even have an understanding that, oh, hold on, uh, just because you know, your your this is a transaction for you. That doesn't mean uh, that you have empathy, right? So, so it's a it's a very important piece. This empathy piece. Well, yeah, and it sounds um, that, that version sounds scarier. Like being manipulated to believe that there's empathy, and like I can imagine receiving transactional empathy, and just knowing myself. I feel like I would be like, I know this isn't genuine, but how do I prove it? And then I start gaslighting myself. Like, right? I'm like, I can, t- like, I don't know. Like, I can tell if it's not real. And then how do you call someone out on that? <laughs> like, But I think you brought up a very important point because that's when victims are gaslighting themselves because you are seeing the empathy. And if you don't know the transaction part of it or the performance... I didn't... Yeah, I would never have thought about that. Because then you're going back and saying, okay, but he did cry here. It seemed like he was feeling bad about this. You're basically driving yourself crazy because you're thinking, uh, is it me then? Like, you know, because he he seemed to be really upset about this. So, so they are actually connected. The empathy piece and the gaslighting piece are connected as a pieces of narcissism but it's important to understand these pieces to be able to and like I said brace yourself Nikki because this is a complicated world not that I want to face a narcissist right I don't think anybody like walks around and is like I hope I really come across a narcissist or I have a parent who's an you don't want these things I would almost rather have a grandiose one who's like just narcissistic in my face than have like the one that I'm like wait wait what are my what like the other the latter seems more like insidious and poisonous like obviously they're both toxic I get it like right you know but I don't know the one that's like in your face it's like you're like oh you are a glaring narcissist I'm not gonna go there the other ones that like present as like this like oh I'm the victim and oh I'm hurt and oh look I can offer you this fake empathy but it's really because I want something from you (laughs) or you know like the self-shaming a look how you know I'm just oh I'm not good enough and this is not I'm like I want to like in that situation I can see myself being like I want to run and help you do you know what is what the narcissists have a field day with what Empaths. Empaths? Of course. <laughs> oh, look right. cry. Because the one who's reacting, uh, like, oh my gosh, oh, you know, I feel so bad for you and, you know, I want to, I want to help you is the empath. I'm freaking the fuck out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying not to do that, but, but again, <laughs> oh my God. it's complex and it's much more complex than we understand, Nikki, and that's what... And listen, I'm going to make it a little more complicated because then we have the communal narcissist. Communal? There's more? Yes, there's... There's a communal narcissist? There's at least four more, but we'll go over them. Oh, my gosh! (laughs) We'll go... We'll just skim through them. But the communal is really somebody who you should understand because this is the person who... Oh, my God. You know, so the, the, the person who's doing all the charity in the world, who's going out there and who's, you know, seems like a really good good person um, because they, they, they're they giving that, you know, the charitable acts that they have and they're helping others. So there are other people who do that and they're good people. They're genuinely good people. But the communal narcissist is a person who does that only and only to get that validation and admiration in return. And it really bothers them when they don't. So they can get really vicious when they don't get that admiration and the accolades and, the, you know, and the admiration back because really that that's their driving force. I'm just doing this because I need to be recognized, right? So that's that's the communal narcissist. And that again gets tricky, especially for the victims. Because think about a, a child who has a parent, you know, who's a pastor and oh my gosh, everybody knows and he's so good. And now this this child who's growing up in this is thinking because the narcissist's home is very different, right? Right. So they're like, no, you you don't know. You don't know them. But then nobody is believing them because outside, they are this epitome of a helpful person. I think I'm going to throw up. That's the communal narcissist. Yeah, that pastor example is like, it's like a a pretty good one. You're like, okay, you see 
this person out in the public doing all this good and they are so loved and beloved and respected and admired and you know it's hard to see what that person's motive is on the inside right and it's tricky like you said because obviously there's tons of wonderful people out there running around doing good for others like genuinely doing doing good for others and so it's like goes back to like that covert thing where it's like really hard to pinpoint absolutely and then you start like psyching yourself out so when somebody is doing a charitable act we don't know what what is their motivation right well and how do you accuse somebody of that like how are you going to even say like oh yeah you're just doing that for attention i like if somebody told me you're just doing that for attention i'd be like go fuck yourself like that's not true you know i'd be like ew question my motives you know what i mean so it's like how do you even go about doing that absolutely and this one is particularly important because I, like i said this one makes it extremely hard for the victims and i've already said narcissism is a problem of relationships because what it's doing is it's hurting the people in these relationships much more than it's hurting the narcissist himself or herself it's just sad and and that's why now the field is recognizing and now finally we've come up with the certification which i just completed it's really working with victims of narcissistic abuse because those are the ones that are suffering Well, I think that that's really important to point out because I think anybody with anything, right? Like whether that's depression or alcoholism or narcissism or bipolar disorder. Yeah, it's like it's really okay. Like it might be difficult like and I'll speak for myself. I have anxiety. I've had anxiety my whole life. Like it is hard to be a person who lives with anxiety, right? It's probably difficult to be a person who lives with narcissism to an extent or with depression or with any of these things, right? It For me, in a vacuum, it is difficult to live with anxiety. It's not fun. I didn't choose it. I don't like it. I I work on at it. You know what I mean? But where it is harder isn't when you're by yourself. It's harder when you're with other people. So like, for example, in my anxiety journey, right? And my work to live a less anxious experience of life. Where does it show up the most? Not necessarily when, when I'm by myself. When I'm in relationships, as a mother, as a daughter, as a friend, as you know, like all these other things. It's the interpersonal part of it. And this will be a part two that we we move into for next time. Before we close, we are going to talk about the gaslighting. But when we move into this next portion of it, because this is going to be a series of episodes, like we are going to focus on the relationship part of it. Like this is really important to like build this foundation where we understand what narcissism is. That there's different types. That this is how it presents. These are the different types of things you can look for. But where it really gets tricky is when you live life with a narcissist and how you are building meaningful relationships or trying to build these meaningful relationships. First of all, I appreciate you talking about you know living with anxiety and you know people who live with with depression. But I'll tell you the 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 piece that's not there that that actually makes it easier is the antagonistic part, right? You see where whereas it's you know yes it's hard for someone to live with someone who has anxiety because it shows up but there is nothing like living with a person who's totally uh, antagonistic towards you who's gaslighting you who's manipulating you who's using you you know those are very very different characteristics to live with right so the unfortunate thing is with narcissists the other people are hurting the most well right but i'm saying if a narcissist is by themselves right like and not having romantic or relationships or friendships meaningful friendships or anything else like yes. then of course they could like if they keep everybody over here right yes. at arm's length like and never have anything deep and meaningful like of right. course they can walk in the like we could like they can walk in the world and be functioning right because they're not actually building anything of substance <clears throat> with people and they don't need it because like you and i when we invest in interpersonal relationships because you know you you want to have that partnership for a narcissist it's really about how can this person add value to my to me it's really not about that that reciprocity of a relationship right so it doesn't matter that they're not having meaningful relationships and that's that's what is different Let's define gaslighting. I don't want to talk about gaslighting too much today because I I want to talk about gaslighting in these interpersonal relationships, but what is it, right? So, this is the episode everybody that you're you should be listening to. Like this is part 1. You know, like you got to listen to this to understand because I think that's also part of the problem, Dr. Rasha, is that like we are hearing a, a lot on social media about like how narcissism affects relationships, right? But we don't really understand what narcissism is. 
Right. So I feel like this, this part one is super important for people to listen to and all the different types, because like you said in the beginning, a lot of people think about narcissism and you, you, I, you immediately like go, your brain goes to the grandiose narcissism when we, in reality, there's like all these other ways that narcissism presents. And so before we even talk about how people are having relationships and the effects that narcissism is having on relationships, we really do need this preliminary episode and moment to like go through this almost like go to school, like go, let's all go to school for a little bit and learn these things so that we'll, then we can continue and see how it's affecting the relationships. So we know that Empathy plays a role in narcissism, and we know antagonism and intention-seeking. The next one is a self-righteous narcissist. When I say this, uh, it doesn't seem bad, but it really is. So a person who is perfectionist, who is judgmental of other people, so very rigid person. So say, you know, they have, um, like you're going out, but you're held back because, you know, you've got little kids and... Um, you know, you're like, oh, hey, listen, you know, I'm running about 15 minutes late or, you know, half an hour late because, because you know, the kids or whatever. Yeah, that's okay. But I still am going to eat when I eat, right? Like, you know, that person, very rigid, but also like, uh, you, you know, uh, super, you know, moralistic, right? Like, okay, I, I hold work about any relationships that I have and I devote everything to what I am doing rather than who I am with. Oh, wow. Well. Sort of mimics... OCPD, not obsessive compulsive disorder, but obsessive compulsive personality disorder. It's a person who's really just rigid in their way of thinking. They're not going to budge. And in fact, they're very judgmental of people who don't follow their patterns of thinking that, that how can you not do that? Like, what, you know, so, so they really demean and devalue and, and, and again, there, there's the gaslight word other people in, in their lives because you are not living up to my standards. I set the standards you need to live up to my standards. Wow. So that's self-righteous narcissism. Right. Okay. Then you have two. One is a neglectful narcissist. That's a person who is completely avoiding any sort of intimacy, uh, views ev- Views everyone, and, and it sounds funny when I say it, and I and because I've said it a few times before, and they're like, "What do you mean by that?" But it's really like who's you know a person who's walking around thinking everybody's just an assistant or a helper. Oh my gosh! Okay. So if I'm a, a neglectful narcissist, I don't even have an awareness of somebody else's needs. What do you mean you have needs? Like no, no, you are solely your existence is to fulfill my needs. That's the neglectful narcissist. And the last but not the least, we're done with, with all the narcissists, is um, the superficial. The superficial narcissist. This is a person, and I'm going to say man-child just because we that's just more, uh, a, you, know, you know, a term that's used more than a woman-child. But, but a person who is, um, you know, that vain, that attention-seeking, but really emotionally stunted, has no idea about... Um, you know, somebody else's needs, you know, so, so they're kind of stuck in that adolescent phase where they're just selfish. It's all about me, right? But in, in a very vain way, rather than the neglectful person who's saying, no, no, I, like, yes, I don't recognize your existence, but that's because you're just here to help me. Or the self-righteous who's saying, you just don't meet up with my standards. Like you're way down there. This person is a person who really is just emotionally stunted. So that's your superficial narcissist. Okay. So as a recap, we have the grandiose narcissist, the vulnerable narcissist, the malignant narcissist, the self-righteous narcissist, the neglectful narcissist, and the superficial narcissist. Yes. We covered a lot. I know. And listen, I'm going to cover what I'm going to start with one more piece and, and we're going to talk about it when we come because this question, Nikki, I get a lot, right? Because I'll have... The victims of, you know, narcissistic abuse come to me and they're like, why are they like that? Why? Why are they like that? What is it that causes this, right? Yeah. And here's where it gets tricky because we don't know. We, there is no one thing. So, so it's like, uh, did, and, and a lot of parents ask me that question. How do I make sure I'm not, I'm not raising a narcissist, right? Okay. But it's way more complicated than that. Here's all the factors that weigh into that. So there's genetics. Okay. So Yes. Um, you know, a person who has a parent who is narcissistic, you know, they have the genes. Okay. 
But then there's the temperament of the child because not every not every child who has a narcissistic parent becomes narcissistic themselves, right? So okay, so there's temperament of the child. Then there is the parenting, of course, right? So in the grandiose where we see that overindulgence, uh, in the vulnerable we see the neglectful parents, right? But where their emotional needs were not met. So there is that parenting. Then there is the cultural piece because think about it. I mean, I you know uh, I'm from India and uh, boys are treated way different than girls, right? So, uh, you know, having a boy in the family is like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and if there's one boy in that family, oh wow, you know, we are going to worship you. So there's the cultural piece um, and the environment piece. And the environment piece is the fact that we actually incentivize as a society narcissism. Because think about it, most narcissists are actually successful. And I'm talking about the grandiose ones, right? Because again, that's the presentation that we see the most. They're successful people. So as a society, we're like, wow, yeah, but but look at him. You know, he's an attorney and he's a, you know, he's got all this money and look at the cars that he drives. And so we, whereas, you know, with the other mental health uh, disorders, like, you know, when we talk about anxiety, when we talk about depression, we don't in- incentivize. We actually, like, what's wrong with you? You know, go get some help. The narcissist is like, wow, but, but look at you. Like, you're so charming. You're so charismatic. You know, you have all the... So we as a society incentivize it. So it's really all of these factors. And and then the attachment styles that we look at, um, you know, we, and the attachment style that's most associated with narcissism is a disorganized. I didn't even know that was an attachment style. Yes. So the, the disorganized is really a child who lives in fear. So it's... Oh my gosh! It's the child who wants to attach to the parents, the, to the parent, but still is scared of that parent. You see, so I want that closeness, but I'm still scared because you as in the parent is abusive, they're violent, um, you know, and, and so naturally the child is scared. But there is still a deep yearning in that child to attach. So that's the disorganized attachment style. Um, and that's kind of what we see um, in the parenting style of, you know, when we see, when we study narcissism. So, you know, if we take all of these things and we put it in the blender, we shake it, we'll have some idea of why this person turned out to be the way they are. But there is no easy answer. It's not like, oh yeah, you know what? If you stop doing this, then they would know because there's just way too many factors that, you know, cause it, but then also maintain Well, Dr. Rasha, I'm I'm so grateful we got to talk. We're going to put gaslighting onto next week's episode because we have just so much to cover. We have so much to cover. I'm so grateful because I don't know that people are like doing deep dives like this. And I'm, I'm excited to just have this opportunity to chat with you about all of this information. I feel like we can help so many people. Absolutely. And Nikki, I would encourage your uh, listeners, if they have any questions, specific questions that they want answered, to maybe send it over. I don't know if there's a way that they could send it over to you so that we can try to address those. Absolutely. Over the next two episodes, we are going to be receiving our questions. You guys can DM me directly at Nikki Sapspo um, if you have questions about narcissism in general and then as it presents in relationships. So today, you know, this can, we gave us, we ha- gave our listeners and our audience a big overview about narcissism in general next week we're going to be talking about narcissism in relationships and then after that we're going to be answering questions about narcissism in general we're going to be answering all the q a's can't wait this is super exciting i love that we're doing this dr rashna i appreciate you and your time and your expertise and i can't wait till next time absolutely thank you so much nikki and thank you for bringing up really important stuff Special thanks to Painless Pregnancy for sponsoring today's episode of The Know with Nikki Spo. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to heal with Painless Pregnancy after the birth of my third baby, and I want everyone out there to know that they can have happy, healthy pregnancies with the professional help and guidance of the incredible team at Painless Pregnancy. Use my code NikkiSpo10 for 10% off of your first visit and check out painless dash pregnancy.com for more information. Thank you so much for listening to The Know. If you loved this episode, go ahead and share it with a friend. Words are so powerful and someone may need to hear what we covered today. 
And if you really loved this episode, please take a moment to rate the show and leave a review. Your comments are so important and valued, and they give other listeners insight on what to expect on The Know. You can connect with me personally via Instagram at Nikki Sap Spo and The Know with Nikki Spo. My hope for you today is that you are fearless in looking inward so that you can be your highest, most authentic self and go after the life of your dreams. Dreams.